On behalf of the Vancouver Filipino Seventh-day Adventist Church, I would like to welcome all of you to our Vesper meeting tonight. Happy Sabbath also to everyone. Today is the first Friday of this month of the great season, which celebrates the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. May each one of you feel the love, joy, and peace as you continue to serve the Lord. Our program tonight will continue as follows. After these remarks, we will sing our songs of praises, and then our opening hymn is found in 345 of Church Hymnal, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, followed by the opening prayer by yours truly. A special song will be rendered by Christine Ann Zubade, and the message for tonight will be given by no other than our senior pastor, Pastor Lyomar Makaraig. Closing him is I Am Thine, O Lord, found in 187 of our church hymnal. The closing prayer will be given by the speaker. And then we will have some few announcements after the service. Our program will go on as announced. May I invite you to uh, meditate on the famous verse found in three, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Pass me not, old gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. Why, one of us, thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Why? Oh, 
us pray. Our dear, gracious, and loving Heavenly Father, in whom there is no variableness, no shadow of turning, we come to you tonight to accept your invitation in Jeremiah 33 verse 3 to call upon your name, knowing that we can claim your sweet promise of an answer to all our petitions. As we approach your throne of grace tonight, we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and to open our hearts to be receptive to the message and uh, to strengthen our faith. May you cleanse us from all unrighteousness and may you forgive us our sins that we may be worthy to receive your blessings and the message for tonight. We pray for every single one who is watching online and we pray for the speaker that his message will be in accordance with your divine will and it will uh, uh, strengthen each one's faith. We pray that you will uh, um, bless the family that we represent and um, may we be able to walk according to the light that you have given us each day. We pray that you will help us prepare for the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that um, during these difficult times and pandemic crisis, uh, we have lots of challenges and we have lots of struggles, but we believe and we trust you that uh, you are there to help us and to uh, strengthen us, that we may be able to emerge successful and victorious over these uh, trials. Thank you so much, Lord, for um, your promise that you will always hear us. Thank you for everything that you have uh, done for, for us. Thank you for answering our prayers. All these things we ask in the loving name of Jesus. Amen.
Good evening everyone and happy Sabbath to all of you. Our message for tonight is from Dr. Elizabeth uh, Talbot of Jesus 101 Ministry. May the message we'll hear tonight bring us peace and hope, especially during these troubled times. May God bless us all as we enter this holy Sabbath day. Let us welcome Dr. Elizabeth Talbot. Hello everyone, Elizabeth Talbot here, greeting you from our studios in Riverside, California. And today we're gonna to have a great time studying the Word of God. We're gonna start with a video. So here we go. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative in which every story Every character points beyond itself to one who is greater. The story of Adam and Eve is not just about the first man and woman. There is a true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is ascribed to us. There is a true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. There is a true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go out into the void to create a new people of God. There is a true and better Isaac, the son of laughter, of grace, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all. There is a true and better Jacob, who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserve, so we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. There is a true and better Joseph, who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his new power to save them. There is a true and better Moses who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. There is a true and better rock of Moses, who struck with the rod of God's justice, now gives us water in the desert. There is a true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer, who then intercedes for and saves his foolish friends. There is a true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. There is a true and better Esther, who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one, who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life to save his people. There is a true and better Jonah, who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. There is a true and better Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain so the angel of death will pass over us. He's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, and the true bread. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative that points to one person, Jesus. Yes, it is all about Jesus. The whole Bible is about Jesus. But what difference does that make in our personal lives, especially when we are facing a crisis? Well, that's what we're going to study today uh, from the Gospel of John. But before we start, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm sure you heard about this story, the story of the fork, I call it. It's the story of a woman who called her pastor to prepare her own memorial service with him. He knew, she knew that she had a, a sickness that was terminal and that probably was going to end her life in a few days. So she called her pastor and said, uh, I want to prepare my own memorial service. So she gave all the details about it. My sister's going to do this and my son is going to do that. But then she asked a, a very strange request. She said, I want an open uh, casket ceremony, and then I want you to put a fork in my hand, she said. 
the pastor said, why would you want a fork in your hand? And she said, that's going to be my last testimony. Everybody's going to ask you why I have a fork in my hand, and this is what you're going to tell them. When I go to church now and we have a lunch together after the service, because I'm already older, the young people help me and they bring me my food. And then they come to take the plate away. If they tell me, keep your fork, well, she says, I know a great dessert is coming. So, she says, I'm keeping my fork because I know that the best is yet to come. I know in whom I have believed. And I'm dying knowing that the best is yet to come. This became a very personal story for me because one day I was preaching. Um, I was actually in the state of Idaho when I got the phone call from my mother who had been uh, with cancer for several years. And she said, I'm on my way to the hospital. Uh, I need more oxygen. And I think this is it, she says. But she said, don't worry about it. I am holding a fork in my hand. Well, this became very personal because uh, she applied the story to herself. And I was thinking, what would it take? What would it take for us to live or die with a fork in our hands, knowing that the best is yet to come? How do we go through a crisis when we don't know what to do? How do we believe in the middle of a crisis? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. It's all about Jesus. That's the title of our sermon today. And we're going to do it from the Gospel of John. But before we start, let's learn a little bit about the Gospel of John. Uh, John is, is one of those books that we have the privilege of knowing why he decided to write the book. It has a purpose statement in John chapter 20. Is one of those rare purpose statements that the author says why they decided to write. And we believe John was probably the fourth uh, gospel written in that order. And so why would he write another gospel if the other three were already written? So he says here, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that, there's your purpose statement, these particular stories, says John, I have written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Believe is the core word for John. 97 times he mentions it in his gospel. And he chooses different stories than the other three gospels. As a matter of fact, 92% of John is only found in John. So he uses different stories so that when we're done with each story, we may believe in whom? In Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we may have life in his name. So you never leave a story, John, until you understand how that particular story helps you understand who Jesus is and why you should believe in him and therefore have eternal life. Uh, but I want to tell you two more things. All the great I am's of Jesus uh, in the Gospels are found in the Gospel of John. So this is the way that John helps us understand a little more about Jesus, you know. And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, I am the bread, I am the light, I am the door, etc. This is in the Gospel of John. And so what he does, he writes the whole Gospel in two levels. The level that you see with your eyes and the second level that is a different reality that you come to believe when you believe in Jesus Christ, in the person of Jesus. So two realities, the one you see and the one you believe. And in every story in the Gospel of John, I love this, every story has a dialogue between the two levels. For example, John 3, Nicodemus, you got to be born again, says Jesus. And Nicodemus says, how can I be born again and enter into my mother's womb? No, says Jesus, and I'm not talking about this level. I'm talking about this level. Uh, John 4, Samaritan woman. Give me some water, says Jesus, but ask me for water. I have a different type of water. Sir, the well is deep. You don't have a bucket. How are you going to get this living water? Oh, says Jesus, I'm not talking about this water. I'm talking about this water. Every single story in the Gospel of John has two levels, the one you see and the one you believe in, including the one that we're going to study today. This is very important because in life, we're not going to understand a lot of things. You know, that's why the proverb, uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, 
Do not lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, but do not lean on your own understanding because there's so many things we're not going to understand because we usually see what our eyes see, right? But there's another reality that is deeper for those who believe in Jesus. And I think that's very important to, to understand because our own story is being written within a much greater story of the redemption story. So we won't always understand everything because we only have a little part of it, right? So uh, the two levels are very important. And one more thing I want to tell you is the Gospel of John has seven signs, seven signs of who Jesus is. If sometime you want to do a deep study of John, um, there are seven signs of who uh, Jesus is. And today we're going to study the seventh, the last one, which is the one that will take him uh, to the cross. So let's uh, review a little bit. So John says that he wrote so that we may believe. He puts different stories than the other three Gospels. Uh, 92% of John is only found in John. And the great I am of Jesus, all the I ams, are in this Gospel. Uh, from the Gospels, this is the one that uses the I ams of Jesus. And the whole Gospel is written in two levels. The one you see, the one you believe in, when you believe in the person of Jesus. And there are dialogues between the two levels. Right. And then, uh, of course, there are seven signs. And today we're going to study the seventh sign. So let's go to John 11, which is the seventh sign. And it's the res resurrection of Lazarus. And we're going to learn a lot of things today from this story. And I'm going to use some props, as you can see. Um, and so I want to suggest that if you have a Bible, you really need to have it because we're going to look at some specific things in the verses. And aside from that, if you have paper and pen, it will um, come handy. So let's study this wonderful story. Chapter 11 of John, verse 1. A certain man was sick, Lazarus. There is a crisis you know, we are going through several crises. Some of them are corporate. We have COVID-19 is a global crisis right now. Um, but some of us have personal crises, personal sickness or financial troubles or marriage trouble. Um, there, we face crises all the time. And so that's why this topic is so important, because you might be facing a crisis right now, a personal crisis or the corporate crisis of the pandemic, right? So here there is a crisis. A man whose name is Lazarus is sick. That's how this starts. And don't forget that every miracle in the Bible starts with a problem. So if today you have a problem, then you're a candidate for a miracle. What is really interesting about verse 1 of this chapter is that we're given the name Lazarus. And Lazarus comes from the name Eleazar, which means God is my help. So even from the very beginning of the story, we already have a request for help and we haven't even started the story. Eleazar, Lazarus, is sick. God is my help, is sick. And so we have here the sisters sending a message to Jesus, who is their friend. Verse 3, the sisters send word to him saying, Lord, behold, him whom you love is sick. The one whom you love is sick. So they are expecting that Jesus will drop everything and just go, right? Because the one whom he loves is sick. But something happens here on verse um, 5 and 6. Uh, we have one of those juxtapositions that are really interesting and actually sometimes we struggle with. But before we go to 5 and 6, let me read 4 to you. I mean, John eleven four. 4. When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. He says, I have a plan. You don't know the plan, but I have a plan. It's interesting because God usually doesn't tell us the plan. He tells us how the whole thing is going to end. We know how this whole thing ends, and Jesus wins the whole thing. But we usually don't know everything about the plan he has for our lives. Because, again, our, our life is a little plan within the big plan of redemption history, right? So he says, I have a plan. And then we have that juxtaposition that I talked about, verses 5 and 6. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. What? If you love somebody, you'll drop what you're doing and come running, right? Here it says that Jesus loved them and yet delayed. 
And many of us have had an experience like that in a crisis. Where is God? Does he love me or not? Right? Well, it's interesting because if you study the background commentaries of the New Testament, you'll learn that at that time there was a belief, it's not what the Bible teaches, but there was a belief that the soul of a person would stay three days around the tomb and only on the fourth day the soul would depart and the person was really, really dead. Um, again, that's not what the Bible teaches, but that's what they believed. So Jesus stayed two days longer so that he would arrive, arrive in the fourth day, which meant that Lazarus was really, really dead. Nobody would have a doubt that this would be a resurrection, what he was about to do. So I made a motto for myself because I never understand God's timing. So I, I made a motto for myself that says the apparent delays of God are designed to show the magnitude of the miracle. The apparent delays of God are designed to show the magnitude of the miracle. God is never late and he's never early, but we don't understand his timing usually. So uh, we are going to now go to Judea, says Jesus, verse 7. Let us go to Judea again. And here we have the dialogue between the two levels. In verse 11, he said uh, to them, to the disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. Of course, Jesus was talking about um, death as a sleep. But the disciples didn't understand that because they usually were focused here and Jesus was talking here, right? So the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. We're, we're in good shape. But Jesus has spoken of his death and they thought he was speaking of his literal sleep. Verse 14, Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. This is the key word, but let us go to him. I'm glad I wasn't there, says Jesus, because obviously he couldn't have died in the presence of life itself, right? Um, but Jesus wanted to teach them and other people some things about himself in this process. So this is the time when we are going to use our props to help us visualize what we're talking about. So imagine that um, you have... You're, you have this question, how, how am I supposed to believe in the middle of crisis? But I'm going to put it inside this envelope, the bigger envelope of belief. What do I believe in, right? And you say, well, I'm all set for a crisis. I'm going to bring my belief with me and I will have no problem. As a matter of fact, I know what I believe, right? Well, let's look at, at that a little bit more. So we're going to start here, the dialogue. The dialogue between Jesus and Martha when Jesus arrives there, right? So we're going to take it on um, verse 17. When Jesus came, we're still in John 11. When Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Verse 17. So you remember what that means. It means really, really dead. So verse 18, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. We're getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Here we go. Verse 20. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him uh, and Mary stayed at the house. And here we start the dialogue. Verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. More than a reproach, this is actually a statement of faith. I know who you are. If you were here, my brother would not have died. And she was right. But even now I know, it's interesting because in the Gospel of John, a lot of people know everything. <laughs> like Nicodemus said, we know you came from God. And Jesus is always trying to help them with this 13 inches that are the longest journey a person will ever, ever go through is your head to your heart. So Jesus is trying to say, but do you believe? I know you know, but do you believe, right? So she says, but even now I know that whatever, and the Greek is plural here, whatever things you still ask of God, he will still give you. Uh, she's not talking about the resurrection of Lazarus. She has no clue about this. She's saying, even though you missed it this time, Jesus, God will still hear your prayers. So this is the, the first level of belief, we call it, is the how. When you come to believe, 
in how a Christian lives, the, the, the spiritual disciplines, the how. We pray, we study, we gather, even if it's uh, with Zoom, right? Uh, this is the how a Christian lives. But if you think that the how is going to get you through a crisis, you're wrong. In the moment that things, when the rubber meets the road, when you are facing the biggest crisis of your life, even if you're praying 10 hours a day, that is not going to do it. Your house have to have a deeper level than simply forms or disciplines, as important as those are. So Jesus says, I'm glad you believe in prayer, Martha, and I'm glad you think that God will still hear whatever I ask of him because you believe in prayer, and I believe in prayer too, says Jesus. But there's a deeper level, Martha, that your how has to take you to a deeper level. So uh, here we go. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know, <laughs> because Martha knows a lot of things. She knows that God will still hear Jesus' prayers, whatever things he asks. She knows the how. But Jesus says, but there's more. Your brother will rise again. And, and Martha says, I know, I know. I know the what, she says. Not only do I know the how of, of how a Christian lives, says Martha, but I know that what I believe, not only the house, the prayers, the study, and the worship. I also know the what. This is what um, we call the doctrines and prophecies, things that, we, things that we believe in, the what of Christianity. You know, I believe in the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I am a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for 20 years already. And so here, she says, I know, I got the doctrine of the state of the dead, says Martha. I got this down. As a matter of fact, she almost quotes it word by word from our Adventist manual, verse 24. Martha said to, to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. I know, I got this. So not only do I have the belief package, says Martha, but I know the house. I know that God is going to hear the prayers. And I know the what's my house have taken me to the what. And that is at a more profound level. Not just, I'm not just doing things because, but I know in what I have believed. I know the prophecies. I know the doctrines. But I have news for you. Neither the house or the what's by themselves will get you through a crisis. Because the house and the what's were designed to go deeper. And so after she said this, verse 24, Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, but I am the resurrection and the life. I am. Remember the great I am's? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Oh, says Jesus, I am so glad that you believe in the how. And that's very important. And I'm so glad that your how has taken you to the what you believe. But unless the what takes you deeper, you won't go through a crisis. Because the what's are designed to take you to a who. To a who. To a person. Not only to a how, to a what, but to a who. Who do you believe in? Do you believe in the person of Jesus? Because when you're faced in a crisis, I remember being present when my mother died. I was at her side. And I remember the moment, her last breath, I remember, because you know the last couple of breaths are, are a little more, are a little deeper, and you see that the person has died. I remember standing there and saying, wow, so it's still, either all true or it's all a lie. You, you didn't have time to say, okay, yeah, I can recite the doctrine of the state of the day and I can recite this. No, it was like, wow, either at this moment she has passed and she's going to rest until the day of the resurrection or I'm never going to see her again. It's, it's either all true or, uh, or it's not because of the person of Jesus. And of course, I believe it is all true, but unless your house and your what take you to the who, you will find that it's empty. 
because the doctrines, the prophecies, and even the spiritual disciplines are like um, straws through which you're going to drink the living water. But if you don't get to the who, and this is all you have, you won't go through a crisis because the house and the what's don't give you assurance. The house and the what's help you access the who, but you must get to the person of Jesus. Because when you don't understand what's going on, you're trusting a person. You're not simply trusting a set of doctrines or a set of prophecies. You're trusting a person who has died for you. And so what you say is, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand why God allowed this. I don't understand, but I'm trusting in a person who already has shown me by dying for me that he cares for me above himself. So I'm going to trust that person even when I don't understand everything. And that's the difference when you trust the person of Jesus. That's why it's all about Jesus and what he has done for us. So uh, I want to tell you why Jesus kept saying, but I am, I am, I am. I have a pearl here. I love this pearl. My mother gave it to me as a gift. This pearl is like a giant diamond. It's not real, of course. It has a lot of angles. The doctrines and the prophecies are like angles of the pearl of great price, but they're not the pearl of great price. The pearl of great price is a person and is Jesus. Uh, when you come to trust him, you won't always need to understand everything. The doctrines are angles of that, but <laughs> your Bible study and your house and your what better take you to the who, because if not, it's going to dry up. See, the person of Jesus is a pearl of great price. Um, I think it's uh, very important to understand a concept that I want to share with you right now. And it's the concept um, that some of you that follow my ministry know that I love talking about. It's the concept of the goel. And I'm going to go to, to the cross to, to talk to you about this. The goel is a, is a name in Hebrew. That means the Kingsman Redeemer. I'm going to put this here. The Kingsman Redeemer was a person who was your relative and it was your closest relative who could do for you what nobody else could do for you. Meaning that if you were in trouble, only this Goel, this Goel, this Kingsman Redeemer could do for you what nobody else could do for you. So there were five main roles of the Goel. The Goel, um, if you were in debt, and now were enslaved because of your debt, only the goel could go and pay your price and set you free. That was the role of the goel, kingsman redeemer, Hebrew for kingsman redeemer. But he also, if you had lost your property, the kingsman redeemer, the goel, could also go and pay your price and pay the property's price and set free the property, not only you as a person, but if you had lost a field or if you had lost a house, the goel could go and buy it. Uh, third, the goel would marry the widow of a relative that had died without descendants and their first child together would bear the name of the dead relative so that the line continued. So he was responsible for continuing the line of the family. He also could appear in court in place of the relative. And fifth, uh, if the relative had been killed unjustly, the goel had to avenge the blood of the relative. So five main functions. Well, this is where it gets really, really super good. When God created us in his image, you know, back in Genesis chapter one, verses 26 and 27, we are made in the image of God. At that moment, he obligated himself to rescuing us because he is our closest of kin. He's our goel. So Jesus would come to do all the functions of the goel. That's why one of the main names for the Messiah to come in the Old Testament is goel. Every time in your Bible it says redeemer, in fact, the Hebrew says goel, kingsman redeemer, closest of kin, the close relative that would do for you what nobody else could do. And that's why... Oh, this gets super good, super good. So what happens is Jesus would come to do all the roles of the goel, right? So he would come and die for us on the cross and set us free. That's why he said, it is finished. What was finished? Well, the payment was completed. It was, it was done, right? So it is finished. Then um, 
Also, he paid the price for our property. We lost this earth to the devil and Jesus bought it back. That's why the new earth will be here. Um, he also bought descendants for God from a race that was dead because um, we were mortals now. So God was not going to have descendants from the humans, right? No, no eternity anymore. But Jesus bought descendants for God uh, because now we have eternal life again through him. That's why Isaiah 53 ends by saying he will see his lineage. He will see his descendants and be satisfied. Well, he appears in court in our place, placing his blood on our behalf, and he will avenge our blood at the end of times. He did all the roles of the Goel. That's why Jesus insisted that it's all about him. That's why Jesus insisted that our belief is not simply a package that has some hows and some whats. He said, no, unless your hows and your whats get to the who, you're not going to get through this. Because I am the resurrection and the life. It's not a matter if you can quote the doctrine. It's do you believe in the person <laughs> who died in your place? That's how you're going to get through the crisis. So how important it is to know that, that the hows are important and the whats are important. But unless the hows are taking you to the whats and the whats are taking you to a who, the crisis is going to be bigger than you because it is bigger than us. But when we face something greater than ourselves, we must remember that we have some, someone greater than ourselves, and that's our goal, our kinsman redeemer. My parents in their tombstone have a writing that uses the word goel, and is uh, Isaiah 43, 1. Do not be afraid, for I have goeled you, says the Hebrew. I have redeemed you. I have goeled you. I have called you by name. You're mine. So don't be afraid, right? Because, because I'm your goel. I'm your kinsman redeemer. It's the person of Jesus that gives us the assurance in the crisis. Because our intellect won't do it. Our wisdom won't do it. Um, sometimes you will run out of strength, out of persistence, out of wisdom. The assurance comes from the person of Jesus who has, you know, when, 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 um, when you don't understand God's hand, when you don't understand what he's doing, what he's allowing, trust his heart because you have already seen his heart at the cross. Even when you don't understand his hand, you can trust his heart. So let's go back to our story. Our story um, says that at the end, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection, John eleven twenty-five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? You know so many things, but do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the son of God. I, I have believed this. Okay, says Jesus, then let's go to the tomb. If you really have believed in me, let's go to the tomb. You know, I had the incredible um, opportunity and privilege of anointing both of my parents when they were dying. I lost both of my parents within two years of each other, uh, both to cancer. And I'm an only child. I don't have any siblings. So it was, it was a tough time. And I remember anointing my dad. My dad was a minister all his life, more than 40 years, a minister. And... Uh, it came time to not only anoint him, but ask him if he believed in Jesus. It, was, it sounded like a strange question for a minister, an Adventist minister, all his life. And I said, Dad, I'm going to go to this story. And I opened in John 11. And I said, Dad, Jesus said, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Dad? Do you believe? It's different, right? When you say dad, than when you anoint anybody else. Dad and mom are different. And I said, do you believe this, dad? And he said, yes, I believe. I'm going to see Jesus face to face, not because my life was perfect, but because of what he has done for me. And he died with peace in his eyes, like my mom did too. Absolutely assured that the best was yet to come. You know? The best is yet to come. How do I know this? Because my house have been perfect or my what's, I can save them by heart? No, no. 
is because my house and my what's are taking me to the person of Jesus who has done everything that was needed because he's my Goel, my kinsman redeemer. He lived a perfect life in my place that goes on my record. He died a perfect death as, as a payment for my sins. He resurrected perfectly, so I know I will be raised with him. He did all of it. Where is my assurance? In my house and in my what's? No, as important as those may be. My assurance is when my house and my what's take me to the who. The person of Jesus is my assurance. So Jesus said, let's go to the tomb. If, you're, if you believe in me, let's go to the tomb. And so verse 39, uh, John eleven thirty nine. 39, Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, who a moment ago said that she believed in Jesus, said to him, Lord, but this time there will be a stench for he has been dead four days. Remember, four days, many times in the narrative, four days means he's really, really dead, Jesus. We can't remove the stone. And Jesus said, didn't we settle this a moment ago? <laughs> didn't you say that you believe in me? And so Jesus said, verse 40, did I not say to you that if you believe, remember key word for John, that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they removed the stone and then he prayed because Jesus did believe in prayer. And he said to his father, Father, thank you, verse 41, that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. I, I, I know that you hear me. But because of the people standing around, I say it, so that they may believe that you sent me. All these people, they know so much. They can quote so many things. They believe in prayer, but they don't believe in me, says Jesus. So I'm saying it aloud so that you, they may believe that you sent me, that it's all about me, says Jesus. And then he said, verse 43, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come forth, come out. And the dead men came out. I go often to my parents' cemetery, um, and I imagine that morning, resurrection morning, when Jesus would say, come out, come out. And I know it will happen. Not because of who I am, not because of who they were, not because of the house they practice or the what's, as important as those are, is because these things took them to the person and they died believing in the person, Jesus Christ. When we get to the book of Revelation, we again have the final I am's for the end of times. God knew we would need a few I am's in moments of crisis and pandemics and tornadoes and storms and earthquakes. He knew that we would need to remember who Jesus is in order not to be afraid. Chapter 1, verse 17, Jesus says, do not be afraid, says to the prophet. I am the first and the last. I am the first and the last. The word last in Greek is eschatos, is where we get the word eschatology. Many people talk about eschatology, especially nowadays, the, the end times is eschatology. But Jesus said, don't forget that I am the eschatos. If you're going to talk about eschatology, the last day events, don't forget to talk about me, says Jesus, because if not, you're going to be afraid. The crisis is going to get to you. When you talk about the end of times, make sure you are not only talking about hows and whats, but specifically talking about who, because I am, Jesus says, the first and the eschatos. I am the last. I am the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. I am that. When he ends the whole Bible, he ends it again with, with I am. Don't forget, says Jesus, I am, I am. So when you face the last days, don't forget, I am. Chapter, two, uh, verse thir uh, chapter 22, verse 13, at the very end, I am the Alpha and the Omega, same concept. The first and the eschatos, the beginning and the end. I am the whole thing. I'm the A and the Z and all the letters in between. I cover the whole thing, says Jesus. So trust me. As a matter of fact, he says, uh, chapter 21, we love this, this verse, right? Uh, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, 21.4. Uh, will no longer be any death 
or mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And then he said, Revelation 21, verse 6, he said to me, it is done. This, this is how we spell salvation. D-O-N-E, done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. It's without cost to us, but it cost him his life. He who overcomes, which in Revelation means um, believes in the Lamb until the very end, will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This covenantal phrase that we had all along. They will be my people. I will be their God. I will be their God. They will be my people. They're mine. I'm their Goel. I'm their kinsman redeemer. And I will be with them. It is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So when you uh, face a crisis, you know how the story ends. Jesus wins. But we are with him, and he is our goel. He's our kinsman redeemer. So you know how your story ends. You, you might not know a lot of things in between, but you know how your story ends. Um, I want to tell you, uh, I talked a little bit about this in, um, in some other camp meetings, but um, I love the story of the Hoyt team, H-O-Y-T. Uh, they live here in California. The father um, had a, a handicapped son, very handicapped quadriplegic with cerebral palsy. And um, the doctor said, this kid is not going to live much. You should let him go and not worry much about it. The father said, absolutely not. He's my son. I will do everything he needs. I will do it for him. So when the kid was nine years old, they entered a 5K marathon with a wheelchair. When they crossed the finish line, uh, the father saw a big smile in this child's face. Uh, and so that the child was happy and wanted to know why. And, and the child could not uh, write, could not speak, but they had built a computer for him that he would type with his forehead. Very intelligent uh, child. And when they got home, he typed, Dad, today when we crossed the finish line, I felt like I could walk. I felt like a winner. I, I felt like I was worth something. And the father said, of course, my child, you're worth everything. You're my child. And we're going to enter every possible marathon from now on and I will take you to the finish line. Just believe in me. I will take you there. Well, I followed them for more than two decades. But it was the day that I saw the video of the Ironman triathlon, the one that the, uh, the triathlon that they uh, have in Hawaii. And I saw this father um, take this child to, through the whole thing, 2.4 mi uh, miles, which is almost four kilometers, uh, swimming took a little boat behind, carrying the child. Uh, that was now a young man, right? And then he, they, 112 miles of biking, 180 kilometers of biking. He took the son in a, in a little seat in front, in, in front of the bike. And then uh, 42 kilometers of um, running with a wheelchair. And I saw this father take him through the whole thing until they crossed the finish line. That's when I understood the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, there is a song in, in the video that you can see in YouTube. YouTube has a video that I can't show you because of license issues, but you can check it out. Um, Team Hoyt. My Redeemer Lives is the, is, is the song. Hoyt is H-O-Y-T. My Redeemer Lives. Check it out on YouTube. Um, and I heard the song, my Redeemer lives, my Goel lives, and saw this father taking the child all the way to the finish line. And I saw this child celebrating, as handicapped as he is, seeing him celebrate because he had crossed the finish line. I understood why it's all about Jesus. <laughs> because I can know how a bike works. I can know a lot of things, but I'm so handicapped that my house and my watch would never be good enough to say, okay, I'm saved because I did things right. No, I have to trust in a person who has done for me what I could have never done for myself. So remember, it's all about Jesus. We have a goel. We have a kinsman, redeemer, who has done everything for us. Let's go back to the cross. That's where we need to be from beginning to end. Because he is the beginning and he is the end. He's everything in between. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. How important it is, if you're going through a crisis or if you're not, to remember 
that there is a person who has done for you what you could have never done for yourself. He is the pearl of great price, and it is all about Jesus. So turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. God bless you. bow our heads for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the message of assurance and the hope that we heard tonight. Thank you for reminding us that it is all about you, Lord. Help us to remember that regardless of all the difficulties we face each day, we only have to believe that you are with us and that you will help us overcome. Bless us now as we enjoy the rest your Sabbath brings. And may your name be always praised. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath everyone and God bless you all. For our announcements, tomorrow, December 5, our Sabbath service will be sponsored by the Pathfinders, led by Sister Darlene Vinjola. Next Sabbath, which is the second and also on the fourth Sabbath, um, December 12 and December 26, our Sabbath service will be handled by the Abundant Life SDA Community Church, and it will be live through Zoom. And then the third Sabbath, which is December 19, the service will be uh, sponsored by the FAA BBC, the Filipino Association of Advent Believers in British Columbia led by uh, its president, Pastor Jody Malabanan. Good night, and may God bless you. See you tomorrow.